Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I'm Uwe. I'm German. Uh, I've been initiated the traditional way in Gabon in 2001. I'm a pediatrician and musician as well. Great. So this is uh, the safety conversation. And so um, we've got a bunch of folks here that um, have a lot to say about safety. And um, yeah, I don't know. I think maybe a good way to start the conversation would be, um, I don't know, for me personally, I'm afraid to do a boga or ibogaine. Should I be? Can it be done safely? Um, is death preventable if the right metrics are taken? In, in general, ibogaine is a pretty damn safe drug. And those people who are not addicts, who are seeking a spiritual experience, who are young and healthy, even if they were to buy a dose online and somebody gave them the proper instructions, and I'm like, ibogaine's not a drug you're going to take and go to the club and go dancing, okay? Um, unlike other entheogenic drugs, you need to, you know, your eyes need to be closed. By the way, somebody, I saw there's a movie that was supposed to be shown here. It's somebody by name Sarah Clinic, Sarah's Clinic. And she's in the kitchen cooking, and there's patients lying on the couch, and another patient here, and another patient there, and they're all on ibogaine. The, I tell my patients, just listen to music. You don't, when you're on ibogaine, you don't want to have this internal dialogue in your head. What you want to do is not think. What is genius? The ability to think of one thing at one time. It's the same thing as meditation. When I'm meditating, I'm closing out every extraneous thought. So if I'm taking Ibogaine and I'm listening to music perfectly and I have eye shields on, I tell patients, make believe you're a player in the band, pick an instrument, and you're playing in front of an audience of 30,000 people. And if you make a single mistake, people are going to notice. So follow the music perfectly. And if you start to talk to yourself, the committee of millions in your head starts to activate, just go back to the music, and the thing will take care of itself. So in general, in a healthy population, the, the risk, the morbidity, mortality is considered to be about 0.3%. But remember, we're treating addicts here. We're treating patients with HIV, hepatitis, alcoholism. They are not the healthiest population in the world. And some of our patients are not 25 and 30 years old. You know, yeah, you're 25, healthy, 30, go to Gabon in the middle of the jungle, get initiated, and nothing's going to happen, you know. I think very few little buiti die from eating root bark, you know. But remember, we're treating a very sick patient population. Get a full medical history, know what drugs they're on. The Bwiti are not taking Prozac and Seroquel and Zyprexa, you know, like our patients are. So um, looking at numbers, the mortality rate can be as high in untrained hands as 3%, and mortality, and depending on who you're speaking to, or, or three, three per hundred. Uh, Dr. Alper has been following the deaths, but I have a folder of over 60 Ibogaine deaths. Um, every single one of those deaths I looked at could have been avoided. Every single one. Do, if that patient was properly screened, if labs were done, if somebody had an IV and a cardiac monitor in, these people had severe addiction. Some of them had anorexia, bulimia. Some of them had pre-existing heart conditions. Ibogaine does not give people heart attacks, okay? You're not going to have a heart attack unless you get scared to death, okay? And if you're getting scared to death, then you, as a treatment provider, you should know how to shut this down. And I told you, use benzos. You can give a little bit just to take the edge off that the patient who's so nervous that they can't, they keep taking the headphones off and give them two milligrams of IV Valium and all of a sudden they're chilling and loving it, okay? But don't give them antipsychotics. Um, Every single death that I've seen could have been avoided with proper pretreatment protocols and having someone there who knew what to do. Um, I think over the last, since 96, since I'm giving treatments, how many times something happened on an EKG, which I was right there to administer a drug that avoided a problem. So I haven't had, I've never had a single patient go to an emergency room, nevertheless have an adverse event. But had I not been there, I could think of, dozens of patients who would be, not be here today. So the answer how safe it is, I mean, if you're young and healthy and you, you've got a normal EKG and you don't have congenital prolonged QT syndrome and you don't have other drugs on board that are QT prolongers, yeah, pretty safe. But again, I'm treating addicts who are not a healthy population. Yeah, thank, and Jamie, you like something to add? Yeah, I just wanna add like, um, you know, the human body can take only a certain amount of metabolic stress, so, 
Ibogaine does stress the body on a metabolic level. Detox is very metabolically stressful too. So those two things in combination tend to potentiate each other a little bit. And and several of the cases that I reviewed were um, signs of metabolic acidosis and other severe metabolic stress. And that's something the body can't appropriately handle. Many of our clients come to us truly addicted on opiates and benzos. I'm here to tell you, despite, you're going to get somebody who said, well, I was taking Xanax and I took Ibogaine and it totally took, I never took another Xanax again. Well, good for you. I am here to tell you that Ibogaine does nothing for benzodiazepine withdrawal. It does not help at all. It's a different part of the brain and it just doesn't work. And I've seen people on low-dose benzos still be in horrible anxiety because they've missed their benzos. So when patients come, I'm taking Xanax or clonopine, and I'm not taking like 16 milligrams a day. I take, you know, four milligrams of Xanax a day or four milligrams of clonazepam a day, but I want to get off the opiates. Can you give them a flood dose? Yeah, just continue the benzo. So I say, look, let's get you off your opiates first, continue on your benzo, and then once you got 90 days clean, show me you got 90 days clean off your opiates by dropping urines, and then we can do a slow outpatient taper of the benzos. We can do standard benzo detox. But if you don't realize that your patients are taking benzos, and you stop them, and now they're taking, or they're alcoholic, and you, the risk of having a seizure during Ibogaine, or them having a horribly anxious experience, or being incredibly anxious and uncontrollable after Ibogaine, is, is very, very high. So be careful. With, if those people are on benzos, then leave them on their benzos. Cool. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you, Anwar, actually, about microdosing safety. Um, so, um, and the question is really, uh, even with the classical psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin, that aren't known to have um, cardiotoxic sort of effects, uh, you know, they're not known to be uh, physically dangerous generally, there is concern. Um, I think there's a lot of more research that needs to be done, but I've read some articles from, you know, papers on rats and whatnot that because um, with microdosing, you're now, instead of just doing, you know, a big dose once, you're taking it more consistently. Um, there are potential risks of microdosing psychedelics, not even I begin, but just other psychedelics, uh, you know, to be activation in the heart that can happen with continuous use. Is that something that could be a concern for microdosing? I begin. To be very honest with you, the reason why I decided to do a presentation on microdosing, uh, it's because it's about time that we need to research microdosing. It's crucial. Uh, none of us have the facts yet with microdosing because if you listen to stories uh, about people microdosing, it's always different quantities, different parts of uh, whether it's root bark or TA or PTA or HCL, then also where are they buying it from, the different vendors. So you're not getting any consistency in any report. So it'll be wrong for me to give you an answer with something we don't know yet. More research uh, needs to be done. Yeah. Some research, some research was actually just done on microdosing using noribogaine. The thought is, noribogaine is the active metabolite and is not psychoactive. So the question is, if we give somebody noribogaine, will they not have any kind of entheogenic experience, but will it block withdrawal? I believe it will. A very small study was just done showing that it will with very, very low dosages. However, very, very early in the um, mid-90s to late 90s, we start, what happened when people were taking 25 to 50 milligrams a day every single day? Extremely rapid tolerance develops to Ibogaine. Not nor Ibogaine, but Ibogaine. Meaning I need to take more to get the same effect. By the fourth to fifth day, and certainly by seventh or eighth day, your, the Ibogaine is acting very much like taking a small dose of Adderall, like an ADD drug, like take a speed drug, you know, basically methamphetamine. Um, Yet, after detox, if somebody has been on, you know, detox, giving a flood dose to somebody who was on methadone or suboxone, we've talked about this, calculating the half-lives, you can't give a flood dose to somebody who's on a long-acting opiate, and this is a conversation for another day, but if you don't know how to do it, I've heard people call up clinics and they say, you got to be off suboxone for 30 days, and they say, well, how am I supposed to get my opiates, and they're told, just go out and buy heroin, again, like you did before. 
And that's like absurd to me. Um, there's a formula. Depends on how many milligrams of suboxone or methadone you're taking, and you can figure out exactly how many days it will take to get that patient off, and you substitute some other pharmaceutically acceptable opiate. It's illegal to do this in the United States, but it can be done in other countries, and you maintain them on, on morphine or oxycodone, so they don't have to do criminal activity. But usually, even a patient who's taking 16 milligrams of suboxone, on day eight, I can give a full flood dose of Ibogaine too, and I've done it hundreds of times successfully. There's something I didn't mention before, and I feel it's very important to mention. There is a drug out now in the United States called Vivitrol. It's called, which is deep naltrexone, the long-acting form of Narcan. We all know what Narcan is. It's the treatment of overdoses. When somebody dies and turns blue, they get a shot of Narcan, they wake up within a second. It's a pure antagonist of mu and cap opiate receptors. So Vivitrol is a long-acting shot that lasts for 30 days, once you're off opiates and once you're off alcohol, and it's supposed to prevent cravings. I did some of the clinical trials on this. Whether this really does works or not, or this is placebo effect, is a conversation for another day. But I do not believe anybody who takes a flood dose of Ibogaine should receive Vivitrol or, or oral naltrexone, known as Revy in the United States, for 90 days post Ibogaine. If we're assuming that Ibogaine is a pseudo-irreversible agonist of mu and kappa opioid receptors, and now I'm giving a pure antagonist, okay, I'm having two, two different drugs fighting for the same receptor. And I think, so do not give Vivitrol or naltrexone to patients till they have 90 days post their flood dose. I also have a very strong opinion about this. My personal opinion is I, I very often give booster doses to patients after a flood dose, okay? I want to see that you got at least four days with no withdrawals, especially if you've been on like Suboxone for 10 years, you might need some small dosages. And I'm talking about 100 to 200 milligrams. You don't have to be monitored. You can go play on your computer, watch TV. You know, you've already gone through your flood dose. I know your cardiac's stable. And then maybe the next three days later, they get 100 milligrams, three days later, 50 milligrams, and now they're good, go, you know, to, to, go, to go home. In my opinion, using another psychedelic drug 90 days within Ibogaine has got pure insanity. And there's clinics advertising now that we give you Ibogaine and seven days later we give you ayahuasca. Okay. We give you cambo medicine. First of all, cambo in itself, I, I don't know what that's about because I see there's nothing to learn. It's a purging experience, so I get hot, deathly ill and throw my guts up. I mean, what's there to learn from that? You want to do Cambo? Great, do Cambo, but don't do it 90 days with an Ibogaine. We do not know what Ibogaine is doing to the brain at all or where it's done. I hope within the next year in Miami, where we may be starting a phase one study where we're actually going to be doing PET scans on patients who are taking Ibogaine and Ibogaine, and then we'll know exactly what parts of the brain we are hitting. But to say, you know, my clinic has a program where we're going to give you a flood dose because you're a heroin addict, and seven days later, we're going to give you a full dose of ayahuasca? It, it, it doesn't make sense to me. I think it's disrespectful of the, sacri of the plant. It's disrespectful of both these substances. It's scary to me. And even ayahuasca, you know, has a severe interaction with any, you know, with tyr tyramine, you know, red wine, cheese, certain amino acids. There are dietary restrictions to this, which people pay very little attention to. So... I'm just saying in this person's opinion for Ibogaine, nor Ibogaine supposed to last for 90 days, keep that a pure experience and keep it not Ibogaine for those 90 days. And, you know, you want to do these other entheogenic drugs, you can wait three months. They don't have to be given, you know, the next few days. I just want to add uh, something also very important. I mean, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Camlet has said it all. But what I notice in order for them to be able to go into the treatment much more comfortable and much more easier. Uh, I spend at least two hours on doing something called orientation and preparation. And I think that's also important, especially for all medical professionals, that you have to get informed consent. And it is our responsibility to tell the patient everything about Ibogaine, the good and the bad and the ugly. You have to tell them everything. And only after you explain all that to them, then you make them sign on the dotted line 
then you are covered. That's how the one case in London, uh, the psychiatrist has got charged, for, suspended for six months, because not because he was being Ibogin, because he didn't have informed consent. So I think it's very crucial that uh, a reasonable amount of time is spent explaining everything that that, that patient needs to know, including in detail, we actually go through the overview of our protocol, how the capsules are given, why are they spread, why do we ask you to fast, what's the reason for fasting, why it's important not to eat anything, why do we search you, for what reason do we search you, uh, if you try to smuggle something in here and you manage to get it in, then you're going to die, and if you want to die, go die outside, and if you die outside, you're cured. You know, that's the only time you'll be cured. So it's, it's important. It's important to explain these things. Even I noticed that what helps tremendously is when you're even going through the different phases, it's so important to let them know that when the flood dose is, what's the purpose of the, uh, the test dose? And when you get the test dose, do you feel oozy? If you feel oozy, then we get an idea of your tolerance. Uh, otherwise, your flood dose, now when you take your flood dose, are you going to hear a buzzing sound? I had one Mauritian patient, while he was going through the active experience, he was slapping his head. I asked him why he said he's killing the mosquitoes. Uh, actually, the buzzing sound was, sounds like mosquitoes, uh, sounds going through hollow tube, uh, how the perception changes, how the body gets heavy, how the vision becomes distorted, how images changes, even the curtain can change into a person. You explain everything, and you, you basically explain the worst case scenario, and you tell them, this is a worst case scenario, not to make you scared, but to prepare you on what can happen, but it's normal. Don't get scared. And I promise you, when you go through each stage with them, and even you talk to them about what you're going to do in day three, day four, day five, I mean, it's important, you know, you get into somebody who's addicted and is coming from an addictive state to a pre-addictive state in record time, like he's taking a space shuttle. But have, what do you know? I mean, you don't know that that guy doesn't have the skills to cope in the real world, you know? He's, all his life he's been just lying, stealing, conning, uh, finding ways to get his fix, but he forgot how to live like a normal human being, so at least you give him some tools and then you encourage him for aftercare. But I must stress on the point, and I made a DVD out of it, which I'm still refining, which is a 40-page document that we have. And we go through everything. We even go through all the medications that, you, uh, m that if you're on can affect all the medical problems that you have that can affect your treatment, can cause serious consequences, uh, your psychiatric medication. Every single detail is explained, even in the beginning to it's explained that uh, you might want to leave 36 hours later, 48 hours later, because these guys get this wow experience, and I'm feeling great, and I want to run out of that gate and want to conquer the world. You know, all that you need to explain, and I think that's very crucial also uh, for safety. I just wanted to back up and add to Jeff's um, sentiment. This uh, very disturbing new trend with clinics offering ayahuasca, combo, DMT, all these things after ibogaine while people still have a lot of noribogaine in their system. It's, it's, uh, it's not only unsafe, it's a very reckless turn in this vast uncontrolled experiment that we're doing. And, um, and it's not ethical. You're, you're literally turning your patients into human experience, experiments without their consent. So, you know, from a legal standpoint, it, it's not it's not ethical at all, and it's a very dangerous and reckless um, trend that that people need to be aware of because there are, like you said, a lot of centers that are just blatantly advertising this online. And and there was a death recently in Mexico, um, a person who had ibogaine and ayahuasca within the same week, and ayahuasca. Yeah, that was just last month. I also want to mention something I didn't before, if, and don't stack dosages, okay? The risk of having torsades and things, again, as ibogaine is being converted by the liver into noribogaine, you start to see these bizarre T waves and the QT prolonging, the blood pressure going down, and the pulse getting low, all right? I've had patients drop their pulse to six. I have patients drop their pulse to 30. Just don't run and push atropine because it's 30. They're 30 and they're totally awake. 
The patient who dropped his pulse of six was very interesting because we ran, ran running with the atropine to give him. We shook him up. He says, I'm fine. And right away, his pulse went back up. And he said, at that moment, he saw all these demons leaving his body. And like he says, I'm fine. Take out the IV. I'm ready to go home. And he was like straight in a minute. And I've never seen anything like it. His ibogaine thing was over. All right. But when I talk about stacking doses, so if you're giving a patient a flood dose, let's say, you know, one and a half milligrams per kilogram of pure hydrochloride, there's a small window of opportunity where I can add more. I just treated a guy, he was 72 years old, and I was worried about his age. Otherwise, he was cleared and he had done Ibogaine a few times before and done it well. But I really needed to make sure that when he was done with this, he went home without a habit. So we gave him, I gave him a certain, you know, um, one milligram per kilogram, and I'm starting to see these EKG changes. And I know I can give, there's a certain window there of two, three, four hours, depending as I'm watching the cardiac monitor, where I can add a little bit more Ibogaine, somewhere between 100 to 300 milligrams. But if I get past that point, now I'm at the point where I'm 50% into, into metabolism or most of the Ibogaine has been converted to nor-Ibogaine, and you want to go back and give them another five, six, seven hundred 700 milligrams, I think you're, you're increasing the cardiac risk by exponential factors because the risk is from the conversion of Ibogaine to nor-Ibogaine. And there was even a place advertising, and I'll use their name, Ibogaine University, who said, we are giving IV Ibogaine, and it works. And, you know, think, the, one of the first questions we had the day I met Dr. Mash, would Ibogaine work IV? And it shouldn't work. It's going to avoid first-pass metabolism in the liver. So if you take Ibogaine IV, you're going to trip balls, and guess what? You're going to still be kicking the next day because there's no nor Ibogaine being made, or very, probably 80% less nor Ibogaine made. Also, someone mentioned earlier about the genetic metabolizers, that there are four different ways people metabolize Ibogaine, and you can do genetic testing to see and adjust the dose accordingly. It really doesn't matter. That test was, a, we found that test in 97. I helped Quest develop that test, and now it only costs $360. Thank God most 80-something percent are average metabolizers, but you have rapid metabolizers and slow metabolizer. So a rapid metabolizer, he trips quick and it's over quickly, and, he, and wow, that didn't last very long. I, mean, I, I had visions for two hours. The question is, does the rapid metabolizer make more nor Ibogaine than the slow metabolizer? The slow metabolizer, now he may be tripping for 18 hours, but he's not making as much nor as the other one. These are, we don't have the answers to these yet. But I find no reason to, to do the genetic testing beforehand because it's not going to change the dosage that I'm giving to the patient. What I am concerned about is when I do that baseline EKG and the patient has a QTC baseline of 430 or 460, whoa, okay, not a good candidate for Ibogaine. There's a blood test I can do, a genetic test. Do you have congenital long QT syndrome? And this is, I think it's one per thousand of population or something like that. Anybody who's born with congenital long QT syndrome, you give them again, you will kill them. So um, I use a cutoff. If, you know, if you're getting a baseline EKG on the patient and you're starting to see their QT interval, their QTC is in the 400s or above, you better be really careful with that patient or defer to somebody who really has a full you know, cardiac set up where they, if something happened to that patient. I'm not saying you can't treat them. Absolutely, at a cutoff of 460 or above on a baseline, they're not getting treated at all. But be very careful about stacking doses. Because I've heard people tell me, my patient was afraid to take a flood dose. So what I did was I gave him 200 milligrams every hour for the next eight hours. And I think, and they told me it worked, and it might have worked because that patient was 26, young and healthy with no conditions, but I don't think it's a really safe way to give Ibogaine. And then I've also heard of people keeping people, I give you Ibogaine day one, and then the next day I give you Ibogaine, I give you Ibogaine for three days. I think that's torture, it's cruel, and it's unusual. We're not doing BT initiations, okay? All right. I usually have most of my patients back in their bed in their hotel room. I don't like leaving them in the clinic and within 16 hours of, of taking their flood dose because that, that, the, that introspective, self-introspective phase where they're doing the work, um, 
is it should be in the most comfortable, safe setting where they feel comfortable. Um, but this idea of I'm going to give you a flood dose and the next day I'm going to give you another flood dose, and some clinics are doing this and literally keeping patients under ibogaine for three days, whoa, bad idea, and cruel and unusual to the patient and super dangerous cardiac-wise. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, it's being done. Yeah. Um, I've got one more question, then maybe we'll let open it up for other questions. Um, it's for you, actually. So, um, and... Uh, yeah, so it sounds like um, from uh, everything that's been said so far, there's uh, obviously a lot of safety concerns around Ibogaine, and uh, we need more research, of course, and some safety standards. But then, of course, um, Iboga has been used for much longer in Gabon. Um, and so my question is, um, you know, so what uh, kind of safety things are done in Gabon? And uh, I'm you know, curious to learn how this is used traditionally. Um, and, you know, and what's your thoughts on you know, if we have, in the medical model, we'll have standards for safety. But um, you know, how do we avoid some sort of neocolonialism of sorts, right? If uh, having international laws that were to impose something on uh, Gabon. Well, um, I simply want to cite uh, my father of initiation and some other healers that I, that I asked about safety concerns, they all told me that Iboga doesn't kill anybody, that Iboga hasn't killed any human being, but that every death with Iboga, and it, it occurs in, in Gabon as well. It's not true that they don't have death cases. Uh, but they are telling that every fatal case with Iboga is a spiritual suicide or a spiritual murder. I think this this sounds very provocative to this audience and in this uh, <laughs> kind of discussion. But, uh, well, what if we try to translate? Uh, we learn to, to listen to them and to take it seriously on the first view and then ask ourselves, what does it mean or what could it mean? If we translate this in our terms, it could mean that someone would have a reason to die uh, from his own perspective or because he, he has fear, you know? He doesn't want, he, he's not sure if he, he wants to survive or he has a lot of fear. And well, I, I want to use your extremely nice um, um, uh, picture of the, of the flooding toilet, okay? For the long QT interval. Um, you remember that, that she said that uh, it's like flooding a toilet and you have to wait until you're doing the next time. If not, it doesn't work. Um, that the heart cycle has to be completed before the next beat should be, or before the, the next excitation should, should come over. Um, I think um, if your toilet doesn't work properly and it and it and it takes some more time until it's filled up you wouldn't you wouldn't recognize it until there's some shit that has to be removed uh, very urgently <laughs> <laughs> yes floating floating yes not flo <laughs> floating yes okay so um so so what could that mean that um you know there's there, there's a channel directly from the left side of the brain to the left ventricular uh, which can directly um, provoke a heartbeat of the left ventricle and um, you know th there are millions of people running around with long QT intervals and they're not dying on a daily basis but uh, when something happens it's going to be very dangerous and I think that, that on, uh, after Iboga, on Iboga and after Iboga, uh, it's not only that the QT interval is longer than normal, but it's a very vulnerable time. And especially, eventually, especially drug users who are coming back from the experience, they might think, oh, who is tr still uh, looking for me? Uh, what did I do in the past? Uh, how, how will I continue living with my family, with my friends? How will I avoid uh, falling back into the old habits and all this? So there could, there could be an, an, an arousal state. And that's 
that's probably the, the moment. That's what I think. But the, 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 if you show up in the ballroom and you want to be initiated, uh, no, hold the mic. Yes. How do the Japanese prepare you for this sacred experience? Yes, so, well. So, I mean, they just not here to go take the drug and have to, you know, walk around the, the village? No, they're, they're well, preparing the, physically well, the, and the, the 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 psychological way is well. I have to admit that I haven't done it myself in a way. But but I was told many times that you have to do a confession before you take ibogaine, a sort of confession. And and I think that's very wise. Maybe they didn't do it with us because we are you know like foreigners and uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they don't they don't do it with the Michogo tribe. But I've, but, but I've been told. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes exactly. Uh, I suppose at the beginning, uh, the, the, the people were initiating their kids. And there's not so much to confess from your kid, I think. And they, they, they didn't need it in, a, in any place. But Adu Mangana, who is a healer, who receives people from outside that he doesn't know, there's always confession. And it's a very important time. And moreover, if the exactly. guy spends three hours confessing, Adu Mangana won't say, go fast. He will wait. And sometimes we, we, we have 12 hours late because of that during the ceremony. Yes, thank you very much. That's, that's, ex that's exactly what I think, because then you're aware of what is, what is awaiting you, you know? And, and, and the healers, you know, during my initiation, I was told to report constantly uh, what, I was, what I was seeing, my visions. And I was led by, by about eight experienced healers who were sitting around me. So they knew everything that was happening to me and they told me, don't or avoid these people, or open that door, or ask the, ask this person uh, what, uh, why he's there, and, 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 and things like this, you know? So, and w one more thing, Jeff, which is, uh, it was very interesting that you said that, that you tell them, listen to the music, because the only thing, we, we, we were discussing a lot of times with the Gabonese people, about the, 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 the ibogaine treatment that is done in the West. And they found it all very logical. The only thing that they were really shocked about, really shocked, is that, they are not, that we're not playing witty music. They said, oh, that's very dangerous. They will all die. <laughs> well, tomorrow morning I'm... I'm okay, and well, and there, there are so many, of course, I want to make it short, but the, the, there are so many safety, to answer your question, there are so many uh, things they're doing for safety. I think that the most important of it all is that an initiate is never alone. There are always several experienced healers, several initiated people around him or around her. In women it's even more sophisticated. And uh, for a long time for women, it's for, for several weeks even. For men, it's a bit faster. Um, and and um, uh, they know the, the vulnerable points. For example, in our terms, we would say that there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a risk for vagal excitement. Uh, that's exactly when, 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 when we go to the toilet, for example. They say that when the initiate is going to toilet, that's the moment where the bad spirits can, can enter the body. And there are always two, three people around, you know, they're touching you while you're <laughs> pissing in the jungle. <laughs> and, and they're talking to you and uh, you should report what's happening and, and they, they're so afraid. It's really interesting that is behind that because when knowing that on the Ibogaine, your blood pressure and pulse is low, Peeing and defecating, especially defecating, causes something called the vasovagal response. The tenth cranial nerve is is exacerbated when, by bearing down. It's forced expiration against a closed glottis. So anytime I do this, okay, I'm slowing my heartbeat down. 
So if your heartbeat is already 50 on Ibogaine, and now you, you've got to go take a crapper, if you excuse my French, yeah, your pulse may drop to 20, and all of a sudden I'm not having a very pleasant experience. So it's kind of interesting that they see it as one way as the demons coming, and, the, and in the phys medical physiology part, it makes perfect scientific sense. But one thing, you know, this whole thing about confession, all entheogenic drugs, like I said, take away these ego protective mechanisms of the brain, and you're left with your bullshit. And if you if you've got a lot of bullshit to deal with, it, I begin to take you to some very dark places. <laughs> However, as as a sacrament entity compared to things like LSD, it is extremely gentle, benevolent drug compared to I believe ayahuasca or DMT, LSD. It really is. It's it's. Um, you know, a, a lot of patients have told me it's taken me to dark places, but they didn't tell me that till after their experience was. They weren't, like, pulling out their IV and running. And again, so if you think, you know, these people who said, I'm going to go to Iboga World and buy some Ibogaine on the Internet, uh, put on the headphones and take it alone in my bed with nobody watching me, you can get lost in five feet of space in your apartment. You'll think you're walking into the bathroom and you'll walk into the closet and get stuck in that closet. And I've actually seen that happen to somebody. Literally. They, they knew their bathroom was two feet to the right. They were taking it by themselves. They went to the bathroom, came out, walked in the closet, started screaming because they're pressing all four wards. They walked into a closet. And they couldn't find their way out because they would be kind of boga. Um, so this idea of giving confession, you know, in other words, you know, we stay as sick as our secrets. And if I get rid of my secrets, the chances of having a more pleasant experience, I think, is going, you know, to, to be better. Um, the interesting other thing I found is how many people who, who under the effect of Iboga, realize um, traumas and assaults that happened to them as children that they had no recollection of. In the beginning, when we started doing the same kids studies, so many women were coming back telling us that they remembered being sexually assaulted by somebody in the family or a gardener or an uncle or a brother that we thought we, thought we were creating false memories by asking them in the question in the post I began questionnaires because it can't be this prevalent like half the women were sexually assaulted i mean the numbers were huge and as we got to fo we followed these patients for years some of these patients i treated 20 years ago i'm still in contact with them and as we got to know their families and 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 tell them what to do after they said yeah you know my uncle my brother whoever had sexually assaulted me what they should do about that much to my surprise it was true and it gave them access to kind of things that they didn't have access to before in their consciousness, you know. Didn't close the trauma, but gave them at least, now I know there's something I've got to get closure to. And another thing, a lot of patients who take an Ibogaine will say, I never want to go back and take it again. That was great. I never want to do it again. Well, tell me six or a year later, i got to go back. There's more work for me. The, the drug told me there's more work for me that has to be done, and I have to go back and complete the work. I've actually had patients tell me that's the last time they t they told me I'm done. I, I've you know I don't have to come back anymore. I just find that kind of interesting, and also fascinating is the commonality of stories that people who know nothing about each other. We have over 300 videos of post ibogaine elicitations on film, and how many people have seen exactly the same visions is just remarkable to me. You know, you know, and. And it's funny, they describe these, this African scene, which does not look or sound like anybody that's witty, but they're, all, they're, they're almost describing the same, watching the same movie. So, for, you know, tapping into some sort of, you know, universal consciousness or the spirit of the plant itself, the spirit of the, of the forest in Gabon, you know, I just find that absolutely remarkable. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, questions uh, from the audience. I think Ben. <laughs> Yeah, I, w I wanted to ask you, Jeffrey said that it's dangerous to flood those and then give another dose and that you have a window. Uh, when we filmed our Iboga session, I had the feeling they only got, the. it was a women in sensation, she only got a, well, a test dose the first night, but then kind of just eating the Iboga when it was all in, she didn't get Iboga again, but I'm not sure if that's like that. So I was, I wanted to ask who or maybe the people from Gabon here, if it's common in Buiti to kind of keep on feeding, because I know there's kind of Buiti ceremonies also happening here where it's like keeping, keep on feeding them for three days. Uh, I know it's root bark, it's maybe different, but I wanted to... But before you go on, I gotta tell you something. I've never ever given a patient a test dose 
I, I don't see the reason for it. The only reason of giving a test dose of a drug is to see if somebody has an allergic reaction to it. I've never seen anybody have an Ibogaine allergy. And in other words, if you're, what's the test dose? I'm going to give somebody 100 milligrams and all of a sudden they start freaking out. They shouldn't take the drug. If you don't know that patient well enough to know that they're like not mentally stable enough to take Ibogaine, then, you know, why give them the test? I don't understand this whole thing about test dosing. I've never done it, never needed it, and never had a, never had a patient really, you know, go crazy or freak out. And if there was a one death in, it was in Holland when a patient, the provider couldn't control the patient. The patient ran out into traffic, got hit by a car and died. And that provider said to me, what do you want me to do? What was I supposed to do, physically hold him down? And if you didn't know how to chemically shut it off, you shouldn't have been given the treatment in the first place. You know, you are responsible for that person's life if you're doing the treatment. And you know, if that patient is going to decide, I want to pull these lines out or whatever and go running and play in the street and screw you, and if you don't know how to stop that and control that, you should not be doing a treatment. You know? um, but I've seen videos in Gabon, UAS. I don't know if those people could tell me well, more. With, they I would like to, to answer the question. Well, our, experience, uh, our experience with the Michuro tribe is exactly what you are telling, that they are giving a test doses, and then 14 hours later, the flood doses. With the women, the men are just taking ibogaine. Um, they never take it twice, but we know from the Fang tribe that they do it. They do it one day after the other. They are taking several amounts. We don't know how safe this is, and the, as far as we know, the Machogo uh, initiation is the original one. So I don't know if you can add anything to this. Well, uh, uh, in my experience, there are many different ways to, they do it in many different ways. You got the Disumba, for example, where the, the aim is that the Banzi, we call it a Banzi, uh, the banzi has to eat as much iboga as possible until he lies down and when you pinch it, him, he won't feel anything. That's what they look for. Uh, another, another place, I've been initiated in Myoba. In Myoba, I ate iboga three days long, but not much. I was standing up, I was sitting, I was speaking, I was completely aware. So it was a, a lower doses. They didn't want to sh shoot me down. They just wanted me to be in the ceremony and to be present and to speak and to, to live the, the present. So there are different ways, different traditions. Which is a tree with many branches and, well, everybody does his own way in, in it. Just, just to add on to uh, Joc Dr. Jeffrey Camlet's uh, discuss, answer early on, uh, I also agree that I've never yet seen uh, dead over 2,000 patients. I've never seen anyone had an allergic response to ibogaine. That's a fact. Um, but why I continue doing test dose? Uh, we are not doing this, this cytochrome P450 D26 test to, to, to deduce tolerance level. But I noticed with giving them that small dose initially because they got an hour to play with, they're not relaxed on the bed, they're walking around. We get an idea of, of the tolerance level because if they feel absolutely nothing and, and most of them feel absolutely nothing during the test dose, then uh, we can give them a, a bigger flood dose. But if they do feel something, we can drop the, the flood dose. Uh, I, I've been practicing only one method all this time. Uh, my protocol is very standard but I use it because I find it to be very safe. In a sense that we do a rough calculation according to body weight. So we get a minimum dose and a maximum dose. And then what we do is we spread the, 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 the capsules out. Like we'll give you the 200 milligrams, then we might give you two or three by 200 milligrams, depending on your tolerance level. And then we wait every two hours before we just give you one 200 milligrams. And during the two hours, we monitor your vital signs very closely and the intensity of the experience. And if your diastolic drops tremendously, then we will first raise it before we go to the next one or might delay the next one uh, maybe more than two hours, depending. And it's, I, I, I do it mainly for safety reasons. But we still stick within the range of his minimum dose and maximum dose. Not everybody can handle their maximum dose if you calculate according to body weight. But I find that during that range, and I allow the patient to tell me that, you know what, I had enough. And, 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 and if a patient has that maximum dose and say, no, I still need more, then we don't give them. We say, sorry, that's enough for you.
I think we're getting uh, we're really over time. So we have one last question for the uh, group. Um, uh, or do you have some? May, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. May, may I add something very short? Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to add something. Um, I think everyone that can be done that the patient feels safe and eventually the test, test doses, the, which is done more or less ritually, might be an element like this. Every th everything that can be done, but done that the patient feels safe, that might be a big ECG machine or whatever, a clinical setting, white clothes, whatever, uh, might be a good thing. Because, because I think what happens in, in these cardiac crises is, is what, what, what every one of us can, 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 can uh, 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 experience in a, in a normal, normal arrhythmia because he's nervous. That, that's, that's the point where things happen. All right, so uh, last, uh, did you have something to say, Jamie? <laughs> right, last question. Uh, when we were reviewing the uh, deaths to Ibogaine, the, there were some deaths that were attributed to overdose because the person used while under the influence of Ibogaine. That got me thinking, is there a place in our recess kit for uh, naloxone? Would that be advisable? Um, those, those deaths that were attributed to overdose, if you looked at them, the ones that I've seen, were got they they've got combined types. They took some hydrochloride and they took extract. So we don't know what their dosage was, except that the one patient who wound up in a hospital in Long Island through the underground had some really problems with hypokalemia that existed for days and days and days. And I started getting calls from doctors all over researching. And an article was published that Ibogaine causes prolonged hyperkalemia, and it absolutely does not. So I don't know what went on in this hospital and what they did or what renal disease this patient had, but that was a wrong association. But that overdose on that patient, because he was in Tersades for like three days, um, was adding different types of ibogaine together in a patient, so nobody even knows what dose they gave the patient. Um, also, it's, I see on Facebook and stuff, so it's, I took 3,000 milligrams of ibogaine, you know, hydrochloride. Well, I don't know what, I, all I know is the stuff that I'm using, nobody, anybody would die on 3,000 milligrams. And so, uh, like I said, until hopefully one day there is a standardized product that's made by some really reputable pharmaceutical company where everybody is taking exactly the same thing, then we could start to draw data from, you know, what is, is the minimum and maximum range? What's the therapeutic index of this drug? And what's, what every drug has something is called the LD50, the lethal dose 50. What is 50% of the drug, what is the dose of the drug where 50% of the people will die on, you know? Um, and that's typically every pharmaceutical drug has that. But I, my hope is one day we'll all be using exactly the same thing. And I believe that has to be Ibogaine hydrochloride. You know, it's great. You know, the, we, we're not talking about what's going on in Gabon because I think that's wonderful. You know, like if you want to do ayahuasca and go to the Amazon or Peru and do it in the jungle, that's great. But, you know, in the, in the context of we're treating the disease of addiction or we're going to be treating other psychiatric diseases, you know, safety is everything. Um, and explaining to the patient, if you have many of these providers, I know, have never done Ibogaine themselves. One of the most prolific providers and the, one of the safest providers who's never had an adverse, well, patients gone to the hospital but no one's died, has never done Ibogaine himself. So his ability to explain to the people, how do you operate in Ibo world? is very difficult. Those instructions to tell patients, you know, how do, how do I travel in Ibo world? Not only is that the music is my vehicle of travel, like I'm not going to jump it, you know, being a, if you're, somebody's flying a helicopter and he jumps out and you don't know how to fly a helicopter, you're going to crash, you know, and it's kind of the same thing under Ibogaine. So I think, you know, the instructions you get how to operate in Ibo world, you know, I remember telling one patient who told me last time I did I began, I saw all kinds of demons and stuff, and it took me to some dark places. And I told them, what religion are you? And is there a single prayer you know that you're, has a single power? Because it worked once for me. I said, if you see those demons, remember, you know, good always wins over evil. Say the prayer, snap your fingers, and they'll disappear. And it, when the I began, next day, he said to me, holy crap, that was amazing. You know, you told, <laughs> I did that, and it worked, you know. You know, and it, it's simple mind over matter, but you know, like you said, you know, if you just 
somebody's taking this on their own and they don't really know what's going to happen, and you can't explain to them how do you operate in this different paradigm, it could get really random. And, and you know, I know as soon as I see people taking off the headphones, I got a problem, you know. All right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you have what final words, what, you can all say a final word if you want to. The, very fine. Um, I, I think if you look at the traditional ritual, everything, literally everything, is designed to make the patient feel safe. The fire, uh, the blessings, even the drinks for the ones who are, who are, who are uh, helping. Everything is, made, everything is designed to make the patient feel safe. And that's the, the, the strong point of the ritual in my, in my view. Uh, Jamie Amar, even any one sentence final words you want to say? Yeah, I just want to basically um, put everything in perspective. I think what's important is not just giving the ibogaine. What is important is the setting. The place is very, very crucial. The preparation, uh, obviously prior to that is the selective criteria. You have to follow it strictly. If there's something that you are not you're a bit concerned about, don't chance it. Uh, don't take a chance because if you're going to have a problem in your hand, uh, you are going to suffer the consequences. And then it's important the monitoring is done by a team of professionals, specifically in the medical field. Uh, I know people want to go out there and after they do ibogaine, suddenly believes that uh, the plant told him that they have to be the next ibogaine provider. You know, but they don't understand that, again, you have a medical team and also the preparation after that and the follow-up and the aftercare. So it's a combination of everything in order to make it effective. Sorry, one, one small thing. As here are so many providers, uh, I know that the traditional healers, they are talking a lot about the protection for themselves. They are, they are always talking about the spiritual protection they need for themselves, for their temple and all this. And I think the impression that we, are the, that the provider is, is, is having on, on the patient, okay, that that's, is telling something about uh, the way the provider feels in this world and in the spiritual world as well. And this might have a huge impact. All right, Jamie, you got the final words. <laughs> I just wanted to add that like providers really need to grasp that this is an extreme responsibility they're taking on. When you give someone Ibogaine, it is potentially cardiotoxic. And heart patients don't get sick slow. They get sick very, very fast. And seconds count, not minutes, but seconds count. So you, there's a lot of preparation, not only on the patient end, but on the provider end to know what to do when the shit hits the fan or when the shit won't flush down the toilet. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, then we're going to take a break. Uh, Jeremy, when should we be back after coffee? 15 minutes, so it's uh, currently 4.20, so 4.35. Thank you. 